Good evening. My name is Buzz Eisenberg. I thank you for joining us. I'm flattered to have been invited by Jim Lesko and by Amherst Media to moderate this evening's event. I am told that I was invited for a variety of reasons. One, because I am a moderator, having served Ashfield as town moderator for many years, and because I've also moderated candidate debates and other public forums over the years, and because I'm not from Amherst. Um, so other than the occasional article which I've read or radio report, I have no actual knowledge of or involvement in the proposed renovation or expansion of the Jones Library. So that is why I'm here. Uh, once I accepted the invitation to moderate, the very first decision I made is to not refer to this event as a debate, and I'd like to explain that. Our purpose is not to determine which presenter thinks better on her feet or otherwise to judge their performances, nor does this issue need any further polarization or politicization as a debate sometimes does to issues. And since it involves a ballot question in next Tuesday's election, it's of course inherently political. But I felt that it needs no further politicalization. We've therefore arrived at a format to hopefully promote the free flow of information and to minimize further polarization or political our sole purpose this evening is to provide voters with an uncluttered exposure to the facts and the positions of both sides um, as they've decided best informs voters' decision-making a week from today. Towards that end, we've adopted a format that we hope is voter-focused. There are only four questions <clears throat> which our presenters will be asked. Those questions are crisply phrased, I hope. They are designed to target the principal issues and their balance to ensure that both sides are provided an equal opportunity to inform voters from their respective lens. <clears throat> the format is as follows. Each presenter will have five minutes to make an opening statement. Four questions will then follow, and to each question, the presenters will be given three minutes to answer and then a one-minute rebuttal. Finally, each presenter will be given three minutes to offer a closing statement to you, to voters. We have a timekeeper this evening to make sure that those time limitations are going to be respected, and that is Caitlin Mott, an intern for Amherst Media, who will be uh, close to my shoulder here. Uh, for the three and five minute presentations, there will be a six, 30, excuse me, a 30 second warning given, followed by then a 10 second warning. And for the one minute rebuttals, there will be a 10 second warning. The order has been determined by a coin flip that we've performed, um, and as a result, we are uh, all set with respect to the order of presentations. Uh, our presenters tonight, and we're very grateful, are Terry Johnson, the chair of the Vote No Start Over Committee, and library trustee Alex Lefebvre. She also serves on the Buildings and Facilities Committee and the Sustainability Committee. So with that said, um, I would like to um, get started as long as we are ready. Presenters, are you ready? Absolutely. Good. By virtue of that coin flip, uh, the opening statement will begin with a five-minute statement by Terry Johnson. Good evening. Thanks to Amherst Media for hosting this forum and to Buzz for moderating. So here we are, and it's a bit sad. If the Jones Library Trustees and Director had gotten off on the right foot in the initial planning, we wouldn't be here tonight. But unfortunately, they started with two major false premises, one regarding how many people use the library and one concerning the plan to destroy the entire 1993 accessible edition. The trustees also failed to build a solid foundation of support for their plan by never reaching out to the community as a whole, choosing instead to hire a marketing firm to sell it to us. Lastly, they failed to consider the impact of the debt of their huge $35.3 million project on other town needs. Gradually, as people became aware of the plans, residents began to understand that the proposal is just too large, too expensive, wasteful, and has been planned exclusively by white residents. Not one representative of the BIPOC community was asked to participate in the planning. The Jones is already the third largest community library in Western Massachusetts. 
For some reason, the trustees insist on a building designed for 51,000 library users when actually only 19,000 of us hold library cards. In their own 2020 Community Preservation Act ap grant application, the trustees presented a chart showing the normalized population of Amherst adjusted for 19 to 24 year olds is about 19,000. So how can the trustees justify adding the equivalent of seven new houses to the already cramped site? If constructed, the building will cost way more than it should since the trustees decided without any formal study to demolish the 1993 accessible addition, thus dumping almost 18,000 square feet of highly embodied carbon materials into landfill. Replacing this lost town resource alone will cost at least $7.4 million before building an additional 15,000 square feet over the garden. Knowing now what we do about climate change, can we really justify destroying 40% of the existing Jones? Such destruction undermines a core tenet of sustainability, as the 2021 Pritzker Architecture Prize winners remind us. Never demolish, never remove or replace, always add, transform, and reuse. The trustees have created a false dilemma saying that the taxpayers will only have to fund $16 million of the total project cost, while bringing the building up to code, including new HVAC systems, could cost us about the same amount. It's not true. Do you know that the trustees told the town council last winter that they will not fundraise for a renovation only, even though there are local, state, and federal grants and historic tax credits available? So to get this straight, sadly the trustees have guaranteed that we taxpayers won't be able to save money with a prudent alternative. And we taxpayers keep being told that we can afford to spend $90 million for four capital projects. But it's difficult to have confidence in these numbers when the original estimates for the long-awaited new fire station and DPW facility have recently been slashed in half and no one yet knows the outcome of the upcoming debt exclusion vote for our new school. When these projects run over budget, do we really want to sacrifice other more basic capital necessities, such as road, sidewalk, and athletic field maintenance, and scrimp on operating budgets and social services, such as the CRESS program? By genuinely including voices from all residents who make up our diverse community, we can have a library designed around real needs, be it more materials in other languages, more laptops to check out, or perhaps even that tried and true standby, a bookmobile. Voting no and starting over smart, we can tell the trustees to negotiate with the MBLC for a more modest expansion that includes the adaptive reuse of the 93 accessible edition. Thank you. Thank you, Terry Johnson. Alex Lefebvre, you have a five minute opening. Thank you. Thank you, Amherst Media. Thank you, Buzz. So the current Jones Library building is in need of urgent repairs, including the replacement of the 1990 heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system that is six years beyond its expected service life and is currently operating on only two of four uh, heater, heat, heating systems and boilers. These repairs, plus the accessibility upgrades that would be legally required, have been independently estimated to cost the town between 14.8 and 16.8 million. For the same cost, the town has the opportunity to solve additional needs that cannot be addressed simply with a repair. The current building's constraints with its small rooms and rabbit-worn layout create safety issues, a confusing layout for patrons, especially English language learners or people new to the town or library. It also creates an inefficient workflow that's very challenging for staff. It provides very little flexibility to adjust to the changing needs brought on by new technology and evolving community needs. The current building also has insufficient space to meet the current programming, de needs, programming demands of the community. We often must turn families away who come for programming because there's not enough room. 
Also, because our spaces are limited, different departments, such as English language learners, teens, and adult programming, are vying for the same space, which limits the amount of programming we're able to offer to the community. It also limits the amount of availability of our public meeting rooms to be available to the community. The current building does not have a spa enough space to hold our current special collections, and it precludes us from accepting new donations to the collections. The special collections at the Jones serve as the archive for the town and plays a critical role in helping us to understand our past, as well as the role of different groups in the building of and changes made over time to our town. Expanding the building allows the library to increase certain existing programming spaces, such as additional ESL tutoring rooms and common areas, a larger children's area located all on one floor, and an increased capacity for our special collections. Expanding the program, the building also allows for the creation of new programming elements, such as a dedicated space for teens, quiet reading rooms, collaborative uh, spaces to work on projects, and a community gathering space that invites lingering and social interaction. Replacing the 1990s building and creating a new addition offers specific opportunities that would not be economically feasible or possible without a newly designed created addition. The building project will be able to meet the town's climate goals, Repairs alone would make the heating and cooling system more efficient, but only a new addition can both reduce the load and increase efficiency to create a net zero ready building. The repair option will make the building accessible, but the new addition enables us to incorporate universal design standards. This is a more holistic approach that removes the barriers of access for all and meet people based on where they are with their needs. The 1990 edition was built pre-internet meaning there's no flexibility to accommodate changing technology needs. Digital access to information and digital literacy are now considered a basic human right. An expansion will allow for upgrades to technology and dedicated spaces to address that need. We are falling behind because this is not currently possible or would be extremely costly to retrofit in our current or a repaired building. The new addition allows us to create an improved and open floor design so that staff have better workspaces and more efficient workflow to allow them to a focus on assisting patrons. The new addition allows us to create 24-hour patron access to meeting rooms. It enables us to showcase the Civil War tablets, special collections, and Burnett Art Gallery so that they are prominent rather than only findable by those who know how to look for them. While a repair will fix the exterior portion of the 1928 building, the proposed project spends 40% of the cost on the preservation and rehabilitation of both the interior as well as the exterior of the building. This work will be guided by the parameters of the Massachusetts Historic Commission to assure access to important historic tax credits. And finally, the, town, the cost to the town is known and capped at 15.8 million. This will not change. The proposed renovation and expansion is an important part of helping to address the shortfalls and gaps in our library spaces and resources and of providing access to services so we are not leaving behind our fellow community members who are in the most need. The trustees believe that an investment in the Jones is so critical in its mission, we applied for and received a $13.9 million state grant and then committed in writing to fund $6.6 .6 million of the library project, so the cost to Amherst residents would not exceed $15.8 million. In other words, no higher than simply fixing the urgent repairs needed for the building. The town of Amherst will need to spend between 14.8 and 16 million on the Jones over the next several years. How we choose to spend that money is what will be determined in this vote. Thank you very much. Um, those were clear openings and I appreciated hearing them. And I'm sure voters did as well. So uh, as we stated in the beginning, as I stated in the beginning, um, because Terry Johnson arguing vote no um, began, we will <coughs> alternate uh, who answers the questions first as we go through the four questions. So the first question will be directed to Alex, who is proposing that vote yes. And the question, Alex, is making sure to address both the proposed renovations and the proposed expansion. Is the library project fiscally responsible? Why, why not? Sure. So the proposed renovation and expansion project is absolutely the most fiscally responsible choice. Um, as I just discussed, the uh, current library building is in need of urgent repairs, and the cost of those repairs will automatically trigger um, accessibility requirements. And so at the request of town council and the joint capital planning committee, the library sought an independent estimate for these costs. <laughs> 
Two options were proposed with different phasing models for repair at a cost of 14.8 and 16.8 million. The total cost of the renovation and expansion project is 36 million. The trustees applied for a grant, as I said, and we agreed to fund uh, 6.6 .6 million of the cost uh, as well through fundraising so that it would be no higher cost to the town. That was a very deliberate approach, was to try to make it an easy decision for town. Um, the trustees have already raised a third of our commitment, so we've raised 2.2 million, um, and once the project is approved, we're confident that we'll be able to raise the balance. The town's going to need to borrow money regardless of the option chosen, and the town finance director worked with the town financial planner to provide the financial impacts of the project and how it actually fits into the town's plan. And what this analysis revealed was that the cost of borrowing for a repair would actually be three million more than if we proceeded with a renovation and expansion. And this is due to the fact that the town can use the state grant funds and the money raised by the trustees up front, which puts off uh, the capital debt payments out for several years. And so the renovation and expansion uh, also allows us to create a sustainable building preserve the interior of the 1928 portion of the building, create a flexible space to allow the library to efficiently provide services to the community, adapt to changing technologies, and react to future health and climate emergencies. And these are all elements that cannot be addressed in an existing space at a reasonable cost to the town. They would actually be unattainable luxuries in a fiscally responsible budget but they're possible because these are costs that go simply beyond repairing the building and are being paid for through a state grant. Thank you. <clears throat> and now, Terry, um, three minutes, and uh, Terry is arguing that voters should vote no on Tuesday. Yes, in a word, um, vote no, start over smart supporters feel that this is not necessarily a fiscally responsible project. The ideal proposal would have been to adapt, instead of demolishing, the 1993 accessible edition and then add a more modest expansion with an MBLC grant so the total project would have been less than $35.3 million. Let's break down the current renovation only versus the extravagant demolition expansion project. It's not true to say a renovation would cost the same as the current proposal. Trustees have told the town council that they will not fundraise for a renovation only, even though they own the Jones Building and the land, and that even though there are granting opportunities and funding possibilities available for a renovation only without an MBLC grant. What is available? Local Community Preservation Act money. They just received a million dollars towards a proposal for, for special collections. That same proposal could be given for renovation only. There's Massachusetts Cultural Facilities grants. There are state and federal historic tax credits that could be used since the 1928 building is so old. And they could still raise individual and corporate donations. All of these would bring the cost down much more than $16 million, but the trustees have said they will not consider it. As far as the oversized demolition expansion proposal, we don't feel it's fiscally responsible either because, number one, we never did the library hire a professional space planner to see how the current facility could be rearranged and furnished for maximum space needs. There are many underutilized and locked rooms, and a designated teen room could have been offered long ago if the director had wanted to have an appropriate space, not put the teens in an unsupervised corner in the basement, which frankly is really disrespectful to everybody. Secondly, uh, regarding the oversized expansion, the library never did a formal study to reuse the 93 edition. It will cost $7.4 million to replace that 18,000 square feet of space. Intelligent, adaptive reuse could have been less expensive. This fact alone shows how wasteful the proposal is. And the trustees did not consider how their project affects 
all other town needs. Tra taxes can only be raised 2.5% a year. And right now, we've cut the school operating budget 1.1 million. The fire department is understaffed. Roads and sidewalks. Sorry, Terry, you're out of going. time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now, Alex, one yeah. minute for rebuttal. Sure. Um, so, uh, first, I want to clarify that the trustees didn't refuse to fundraise for a repair. Um, it's that the, the, we feel that the renovation and expansion is what needs to happen and what's needed by the community. But also, the opportunities around fundraising are much better around a new and exciting project than they are simply ar around repair. Um, in terms of granting opportunities without the MBLC, um, the CPA grant that we received was contingent only upon this project moving forward, so we would need to reapply. Hopefully we would be able to get uh, some money, but that's an unknown factor. Mass cultural facilities grants are relatively small grants. Um, they are nowhere in the near of millions of dollars to be able to approach this project. Tax credits are uh, for preservation work and wouldn't be for the interior because we wouldn't be preserving. Um, we did hire a space, we did use the MBLC space planner um, and actually at the recommendation of that space planner, library uh, staff has been making changes since that time. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. Terry, one minute rebuttal. Well, I still think it is the responsibility of the trustees to consider fundraising for a renovation only or to have designed a more reasonable addition, reusing it. I was at the Sustainability Committee meeting the first time when Chris Riddle asked you, where was the formal study for that? And he was told there was no formal study. So I think it's really unfortunate that the trustees got off on the wrong foot and that there are many other granting poss possibilities that we could do. You would have to reapply, yes, but that's not impossible. Thank you. Thank you. Question two, uh, Terry will answer first, and then Alex will answer. Question two is, does the library need to be bigger to meet the current and future needs of town residents and other patrons? Why or why not? I think the answer to this very important question uh, depends on your premise. If, like the trustees, you believe that a library should be planned without getting input from all of our diverse community, and you feel that one location needs to house and host all materials, services, and programming in spite of how present and future pandemics are affecting our habits, and you think that putting three times the stationary computer locations are necessary instead of offering more laptops to borrow, then yes, the library needs to be bigger. But if, like many Vote No, Start Over Smart supporters, you believe that libraries should be develop flexibility and create services both at the library and out in the community, and that a library should coordinate with other town programs, and that electronic e-content will increase, thus meaning less space for books, then no, you don't necessarily need more space. We're already the third largest library in Western Massachusetts. I understand that we have 19,000 card holders, and the library director recently last week revealed a new chart showing the Jones has 24,000 non-resident card holders. So we're already providing services for 45,000 borrowers in the building we have. And I'd like to mention that unlike the Massachusetts School Building Authority, which is very strict on building size, the MBLC lets towns decide the side of their libraries themselves and the trustees planned big. Here are some examples in the current proposal. In addition to the large Woodbury Room, Meeting Room, the Amherst Meeting Room, and the Goodwin Room, the Jones will have a 967 square foot youth activity room for only two or three programs a day. Much more space will be needed for the unnecessary $400,000 book sorting machine. And special collections, which I feel is very important, will increase from 4,200 to 6,500 square feet. But we don't even know if this is needed because 80% of the collection has never been archived. How can we plan for the present and future space when you don't know what you have is worth keeping? And I'll end there. Thank you. Alex, three minutes. 
Great, thanks. So I'm actually just going to respond to all of the points that Terry made because I think that's probably the easiest thing to do. So um, I'm not necessarily going to take it in order. So uh, the cardholders, 27,948 is the total cardholders. 18,985 are residents of Amherst. Um, the uh, size of our population, which has been an often contentious issue, um, we chose to use service population in our application, and service application is one question on a 526-page application. And um, as Terry has um, incorrectly stated, um, that population is not arrived at by using a Wisconsin formula. It's arrived at because 32% of our uh, cardholders are non-residents and 35% of our circulation is non-residents. And so we took our actual numbers and based it against people who are non-residents. And the reason we did that is we're a regional library. Um, we are, as Terry said, one of the largest libraries in the state. We circulate 442,000 materials. We have over 227,000 annual visitors. And we conduct 5,200 uh, hours of adult programming, 16,000 hours of ESL tutoring. And really what that all comes to is the point that Terry made, which is that Library size is not a formula. Library size is based on how your community uses your library. And our current library is busting at the seams. We aren't able to provide all of the programming that the community wants from us. Um, and so the expansion is to allow us to have a dedicated teen space. And she just made reference about uh, a 967 square foot youth activity for two to three programs. But what that actually is, is a space dedicated for teens that will be designed by teens and utilized by teens however they want. Whether that's working collaboratively on computers or group projects or gaming or I don't know what that space looks like yet because our teens haven't designed it yet. Um, she talked about our special collections and I just want to point out that there's a difference between not having an inventory and not knowing what's in your collection. So um, not being cataloged cataloged is actually what Terry's referring to. And items not being cataloged simply means it's more difficult for the public to access those materials um, or in terms of being able to find them. But the librarians know exactly what we have and we know that we need more space for it. Um, she also talked about a book sorter, which I'm going to run out of time to talk about, but that takes up a very small amount of space, but is hugely, hugely helpful for a library that does as much volume in terms of circulation as we do. It actually allows for uh, both health and safety in terms of ergonomics of our staff um, and cuts the cost of running the library. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Terry, rebuttal, one minute. Well, I've heard some new facts from Alex that have not been revealed before, um, and that is uh, the way that the uh, library user numbers were figured out, which is not how it's stated in the application. Yes. The application states that they use the Wisconsin formula. But this is getting into the weeds, <laughs> and there are many weeds about, about this. And I will just continue to say that if a real formal study had been of the 1993 edition had been done, we could have readapted that space and planned an expansion at a much more reasonable price. And that um, we really need to think of this project in the context of all of our town needs. And our town is really hurting with its operating budgets, its capital needs that will not be met and this projects and the debt service will really take away from that. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you both. You're, you're very concise, both of you, each of you. And um, I know you're working hard to stay within our time limits. They're not easy time limits. But I do want to acknowledge that you're doing a great job in that regard. Question three, which Alex will answer first, addressing both its carbon footprint and sustainability does the library expansion make Mother Earth smile or frown? Why or why not? <laughs> Trying to find my notes of that. Okay. Um, so definitely, uh, it it makes Mother Earth smile. Um, so I'm actually incredibly proud of the sustainability work for the library, and the reason I'm proud of that is that. 
When we started this project, it was designed to be more efficient. But with the need for uh, climate change and the shift in focus of our town priorities, uh, we created a sustainability committee. And that sustainability committee had nothing to do with the library project. They were simply people in town who were experts in the field. And they were given a mission of what do we need to do to make this uh, a sustainable project? And they came up with a list of what they wanted us to do, which included eliminating fossil fuels because that is the single most important thing that we can do around climate change. They did something new, which has never been looked at in our town before, and they actually looked at the embodied carbon. And so um, Terry's misused embodied carbon, which is super easy to do because I'm still wrapping my brain around all these terms, but embodied carbon is talking about materials and how much carbon is produced in the production and transportation. So something like steel or concrete has an, a high embodied carbon, but it's not when you put it in the landfill. Actually, those would often be recycled. Um, it's when you are actually extracting them. And so embodied carbon is important when we're looking at actually designing and building. So that's why we're using the cross laminated timbers because that really reduces our overall footprint. Um, we created a net zero ready building and I can't stress enough, there is no way to repair our current building and make it net zero. We cannot do it and not in an even remotely cost efficient manner. And what a sustainability expert explained to me was if you replaced your heating system, which is what we would do in a repair, it would be the equivalent of replacing your heating system but then removing all of your windows because the efficiency of the system is only one piece of the pie. You also have to um, plug all the, the gaps and the leaks. And we have uh, an, a building that was never properly designed. It has a lot of leaks. Um, the systems are built in a way where it's just truly cost prohibitive for us to get to a net zero building. Every expert in town including the chair of the Energy Climate Action Committee, people who at Amherst College have all said that this is the most sustainable option in the most cost-effective manner that takes advantage of a state grant. And this opportunity missed would keep our building on fossil fuels for another 30 years because we wouldn't be able to place, replace our current systems otherwise. It would have to stay on fossil fuels. And that is the single worst thing we can do for the climate. The last thing we did, which I just ran out of time, so I won't tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> you will have a closing where okay. you might want to make a note. No problem. To, thank you, Alex. Terry, three minutes. Well, start over smart supporters feel that Mother Nature is frowning and shaking her head. <clears throat> I will um, admit the Sustainability Committee was very impressive. Um, they did very detailed work, but it was on the wrong premise. Of course, a new construct, 33,000 square feet of new construction will be significantly more energy efficient. However, it's missing the point. The current international core tenets are that you shun destroying buildings with highly embarded carbon materials, that you reuse them and adapt them. What we're wasting here by destroying the 1993 accessible edition is it wastes the materials that were gathered and transported, as Alex mentioned, the energy to construct the building, the energy to demolish the building, the cost of paying for landfill. It wastes the funds spent to build the addition in the first place. The $2.4 million library painting that was sold the first MBLC grant of four million, and the town's share of two million. That's a lot of money to put into landfill. And as I've said before, the cost of replacing the 1993 edition alone is going to be $7.4 million. So we, it is net zero ready, it will be, but at what cost? It's making the entire project more expensive. And the Sustainability Committee did ask the architects for an estimation of what the carbon foot footprint would be for wasting these materials, and they would not do it. So I just feel and we feel that this is simply a wasteful, destructive project. Thank you, Terry. Um, Alex, a one-minute 
um, rebuttal? Sure. So the foundational principle uh, of sustainability is whole systems thinking. Um, and what you do is you look at the immediate and the long-term impacts. And the process that was gone through by our sustainability committee went far beyond traditional planning because it considered embodied carbon. And it considered beyond the assumption that 100% conservation of energy is always the best way to go. Embodied and operational carbon, including the existing building, were part of a whole life cycle analysis that specifically looked at the current building and its operational carbon cost and compared it against the uh, demolition, the carbon by demolition, the cost of operation of the new building from a carbon perspective, as well as the embodied carbon in design. And what it found overwhelmingly was that this was a more sustainable project. Thank you. Terry, one minute. Let's just imagine if we want to add an addition, do we destroy 40% of a home if we're lucky to have one, replace that material, and then add an expansion? There aren't enough building materials in the world to do that. That's why we need to be conservative in what we're doing and think of what we can do the best with the building and town resources that we have. There is no way that we are going to be able to pay for this building with the debt service not impacting on social services and other needs of our town. Thank you. Fourth question. Terry will be answering first. Terry, when voters are inside the voting booth next Tuesday, what do you want them to remember before voting? Well, we all know how important libraries are to our lives. I'm the daughter of a community reference librarian, and I've taught elementary students in Amherst and witnessed the magic of our wonderfully resource diverse school libraries. Nevertheless, this demolition expansion project needs to be seen in the context of all town needs. Just because there is a state grant doesn't mean we have to take it for an oversized, expensive, and wasteful proposal when $7.4 million of the $35.3 million building is replacing a 30-year addition. 25% of all libraries who receive MBLC grants refuse them because they realize that they are too large and they may not be able to maintain them. So voters need to remember that the project was planned without input from all members of our diverse community, that there was not adequate study of the reuse of the 93 accessible edition, that the library has never had the funds to maintain what it has now adequately and not even found money to replace those horrid rugs that children have been playing on. And that Special Collections has remained under a leaky HVAC system and has experienced four leaks in as many years with much damage to materials and the trustees simply left them under the leak. And that the library has been touted as a social justice project when it has not been successful in hiring a diverse staff and is way behind in providing diverse materials and programming. That the library keeps half of its workers under 20 hours a week so they don't have to receive health benefits packaging since the library runs on a shoestring. And that the historic preservation is in the eyes of the beholder and that in fact in the 1928 portion of the building most staircases, woodworking, and fireplaces will be demolished, and most walls will be removed and relocated. And that we taxpayers must make sure that every capital project is done in the most prudent manner so as not to jeopardize other needs, and that your vote is your own. Thank you. Thank you. Alex, three minutes? Sure. Um, so after an almost three-year process involving 23 dedicated public meetings, more than 20 community volunteers and professionals, the entire library staff, and uh, a highly thought of architecture firm in Massachusetts, the board developed a building program designed to serve the library for the next 20 to 40 years. 
And during that time, the building program evolved to incorporate community feedback gathered through a variety of outreach, such as public surveys, community forums, and information sessions, as well as interviews and tours with patron groups, such as the Disability Access Advisory Committee, Garden Committee, Rotary Club, participants of our English language programs, and students at the middle school. The library was placed on a waiting list in July of 2017 and has been waiting for libraries ahead of us to either accept or decline the grant since. The current program is in the schematic design phase. This means the MBLC has accepted our project under the following terms. The overall square footage of the building may not change, and the overall program elements, such as having a dedicated teen area, may not be eliminated. The next phase of the project, which requires funding provided under the grant to proceed, is the design development. It's a six-month process where the library design is finalized. This is an important phase of the project where the community will be engaged to determine if any needs or priorities have changed since the initial application and community outreach that ended in 2016, and to finalize the design of both the interior and exterior of the building. For example, the library met with teens back in 2016 to discuss their needs. It's been five years and those teens are now headed toward their senior year. So as part of the community outreach, we will again work with current teens. A cornerstone of teen library services is the principle that teens be included in planning and be, be given decision-making roles in the development of their space. The active participation of teens ensures that their evolving needs and interests are being addressed and that they will play a key role in attracting peers to the library. Teens who are enthusiastically engaged in planning and decision-making are likely to develop a sense of ownership of the library that will enhance the quality of their experience. This is the community outreach process that will occur for every stage of the library. Voting no on, December, on November 2nd means a rejection of a state grant and moving forward with a repair-only option. A new grant round for the state will open only once all of the current projects on the waiting list have been offered a grant and received. There are 17 libraries on this list, and the MBLC estimates that it's likely three to seven years before the next grant round. Due to the extremely long list, there is a new grant process, which is now more competitive and will take between two to five years. There are currently 40 libraries waiting to get on that grant list. The cost of repair is not eligible for a state grant as the MBLC grants do not fund maintenance repair work. Voting yes means that the community can come together and design and build a new library space that meets our community's needs in a fiscally responsible way. Thank you, Alex. And by the way, MBLC is Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. Thank you, yes, You're that's welcome. exactly it. <laughs> Terry, one minute rebuttal. There have been many meetings and many de dedicated people that have been on the various planning committees of the library. However, there has never been dedicated outreach to members of the BIPOC community or folks who live in apartment buildings and many others. I know, Alex, uh, you were at a meeting and you listed all the different people that needed to have outreach for this, and it never happened. There were only meetings to present the library's plans after many parts of the building were set in stone. The library recently issued a comment that they know that they need to be better in reaching out to the diverse communities and to make the staff diverse and the materials diverse, but so far that has not happened, and there is a great bit of disappointment about that. Thank you, Terry. Um, Alex, one minute rebuttal. Sure. Um, so a couple of things. Um, yes, the library did re recently issue a statement. And the statement about community outreach was, um, I think that we've actively acknowledged, um, we've actively sought out um, participation from all members of the community, but we've never used the specific lens of reaching out to the black, indigenous, and people of color community. And it was a commitment that, um, that, we're, that we're gonna do better um, in the future. When this planning process happened back in uh, 2016, it uh, didn't exclude people of color for sure, but it definitely wasn't done through that lens. And we haven't really done anything around community outreach since 2016 because we've been waiting for grant funding to fund the next phase of the process. So the list that Terry refers to is, is very much true and very much the case and will start once we get the funding. And again, the library is not set in stone. 
the library is very much still part of a community outreach process in terms of what the building will look like, both on the interior and Thank exterior. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Thank you. So um, we began um, this forum with an opening statement by Terry, followed by an opening statement by Alex. So I'm going to ask Alex to close first and Terry to follow. Sure. Three minutes for a closing statement. On November 2nd, you will be asked on the ballot if the town should authorize borrowing of $35 million for the library project, the full cost less the $1 million Community Preservation Act already awarded. The Mass Board of Library Commissioners requires the town to authorize borrowing on this amount, but the amount to be borrowed will be reduced by the state grant and the trustee commitment, bringing the town's actual borrowing to $15.8 million. How we view library services is directly impacted by our use of the library. If you are someone who goes to borrow books, you might see the library as a repository for books. If you go with your small child, it might be a lifeline to connect with other parents in a moment of reprieve. Librarians have the unique role in a community of getting to know and work with all of the patrons who use our services. They are the front lines of noticing where a library is not meeting community needs and the strongest advocates for needed changes. When we invest in social infrastructures like parks, schools, and libraries, everyone benefits. Social infrastructure refers to public spaces and institutions that shape our interactions. Libraries are not the only social infrastructure, but they are one of the most effective. Libraries are institutions of last resort for people who slip through the failing safety net of our society. Unlike so much of what we consider public spaces, public libraries offer environments for people to just exist safely and peacefully, protected from the elements without the pressure to purchase or perform some sort of service. They are the place where children of non-English speakers come to learn, to read, and form a love of books. People formerly incarcerated come to libraries more than any other institution to search for jobs and seek help with resumes. Libraries provide more instruction for ESL and citizenship classes than any other public institution. Teenagers at the end of a school day seek out libraries as the safest, warmest, or coolest place to study, apply for college, play games, or just to hang out. The town of Amherst will need to spend between $14.8 million to $16.8 million on the Jones over the next several years. How we choose to spend that money is what will be determined in this vote. Removing the 1990 addition to the building and replacing it with an addition is the most cost-effective option that allows the library to expand our reach and effectiveness in helping to generate socioeconomic mobility and justice in our community. While considering how we handle the debris of the demolition of the 1990 building is important and will be guided by the Sustainability Committee, ending fossil fuel use is the single most important thing we can do to address climate change. The creation of the addition is the most cost-effective way to move the library away from the use of fossil fuels to help the town meet its climate goals. This project allows us the opportunity to go simply beyond repairing the exterior facade of the 1928 building, but also to preserve and rehabilitate the interior of this historic structure. It is the most cost-effective option to create a flexible space that allows the library to efficiently provide services to the community, to adapt to changing technologies, and to react to future health and climate emergencies. I hope you'll join me in voting yes. Thank you, Alex. And Terry Johnson. You, the voter, have now heard from both sides. It's been an intense five years since the first schematic designs were unveiled to the public. Unfortunately, though, from the very beginning of our efforts to alert residents to the shortcomings of this project, we've been occasionally vilified in very many ways, and I thank you, Alex, this evening for being so respectful. Recently, voters might have seen some of the over-the-top mm -hmm. aggressive behavior from Vote Yes supporters on the Commons, even telling residents that only the atrium will be destroyed. And yes, marketing team has even appropriated our Vote No, Start Over Smart slogan and graphic design in their ads, changing their slogan to Vote Yes, the smart choice, thus purposely confusing voters. We started as a small group who attended many meetings, studied surveys and schematic designs, as well as the MBLC grant application. We learned that sustainability was such a low priority in the beginning that almost half a million dollars of a Green Library Incentive Award was left on the table. It was only after immersing ourselves that we became convinced that this proposed project is too large, too expensive, wasteful, 
and plan with little input from our diverse community. You can learn more from our website, Vote No, Start Over Smart. And we also suggest that you take a quiet walk around the Jones and get a sense of how really big it is. Start at the beloved iconic front door. Walk to the left, turn the corner. When the gray stone changes to brick, the 1993 accessible edition begins. Pause a moment to appreciate the beauty of the garden and the canopy of mature trees, which will be destroyed during construction. Continue along to the back, turn and count off about 30 spaces. That's the border of the 93 edition. Do we really need to demolish so much of this town resource? You, the voter, in the privacy of the voting booth, have the opportunity to pull the town back from this misguided plan. By voting no, you can send a message to the trustees that you want a right-sized, accessible, non-fossil fuel building that makes the best use of what we have within the context of all town needs. We need to look at the town as a whole and how this project will affect operating budgets, social services, and the like. So I thank you, Buzz. And I thank you, Amherst Media, for this evening. And let's start over smart. Well, <clears throat> I began this evening by saying that I did not want to call it a debate. I didn't want to be focused on the performance of our presenters. But in fact, I thought the performance of our pre presenters was exemplary. Washington, pay attention to how we should be discussing things. Um, I want to thank you both. I hope voters got some more information. If they didn't, I hope it was uh, presented in a way that was concise and accessible and will help you on Tuesday. Um, I really want to thank Amherst Media for doing this. Um, I think it's an important service to the community, and I think you, both of you ladies have, have um, made their aspirations a reality, so thank you. And I just wanted to end with um, uh, Albert Einstein was interviewed, and the interviewer said you're a genius and you have knowledge about so many different things. What's the most important piece of knowledge you have? And Einstein answered, the location of my library. <laughs> Good luck on Tuesday. Thank you.